uh, of the macronutrients, protein is definitely the biggest lever that you can pull. Because even if, you know, it doesn't take a ton of protein to get a lot of the muscle building benefits. I mean, I think the benefits really start to plateau out around 1.6 grams per kilogram of body weight. There's some evidence that maybe even up to like 2.4 or 2.8 grams per kilo may give like a little bit more benefit. I think it probably looks something like an asymptote in terms of a curve where as you put more into the system, you always get a little bit more, but it just gets to the point where it's so infinitesimally small benefit that it's for all intensive purposes, no benefit. But you mentioned 1.6 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight. Is that, would you consider that a, a threshold that most people should try and achieve daily? I, I think I see very few downsides to hitting that. Uh, I mean, I know some people, and this is going to get into a separate conversation, but I know some people will say, well, I don't want to stimulate mTOR because that's going to make me die early. And I think one of the things to keep in mind is if you look at, there's kind of this thought process out there that if you're stimulating mTOR, that protein is going to make you die early. And first off, we have very little human outcome data to support that claim. And the second thing is if you look at any macronutrient isolation, I can make a mechanistic argument that it's going to kill you. So fat, if you take in fat, it decreases flow-mediated dilation. Flow-mediated dilation is important for heart health in the short term. Carbohydrates stimulate insulin. Insulin, you know, pro-inflammatory and, you know, all these other things. And so I can make an argument for any single macronutrient to be negative for longevity. I, w I really want people, this is something that even scientists get wrong. They look at an acute response of something and assume that that is going to relate to long-term outcomes and signaling. So let's just take exercise, for example. If I, if you didn't know anything about exercise and I said to you, Andrew, I'm going to do something that's going to make you, your heart rate go up, your blood pressure go up, your inflammatory markers go up, your reactive oxygen species increase. You're going to say, and it's going to damage your muscles. You're going to say, I'm not doing that. That sounds horrible, you know, but it does all those things in the short term. But what is the long-term effect of exercise? You actually get healthier. All, all those things improve. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, protein is a, a longevity hack or anything like that. But what I'm saying is I think some of the arguments out there based on mechanistic, you know, this increases mTOR, therefore we don't want to do it. I think it is a much more complicated argument than, than just that. So there's that. So protein is the biggest lever. I would shoot for 1.6, you know, grams per kilogram. If you can do more, great. There doesn't seem to be really downsides to it, even like up to very high levels of protein. Uh, Jose Antonio did a study that was a year-long randomized control trial. Um, and again, it's just one year, but they were looking at all sorts of different biomarkers. And basically, even up to like four grams per kilogram of protein, they couldn't really find any negative health outcomes from it. Uh, other than people were just so satiated, they ended up eating less calories uh, so protein is a big lever, lever because one, it has a higher thermic effect of food. So you're getting a little bit more calorie burn per day, even though it's not a ton because TEF is a pretty small percentage of your overall energy expenditure, but still a benefit. You're getting the effects on lean body mass. It's going to, if you're in a diet, it's going to help preserve lean body mass. If you're at maintenance, it's going to help build or preserve lean body mass. And if you're in a surplus, it's going to help build or preserve lean body mass. Then you get the effects on appetite. So now, I want to be careful because appetite effects tend to be very specific to individual foods, right? So you can take a high-protein food and make it not very, uh, not very satiating. So take, for example, like a really tasty protein bar, which, you know, back when we were getting into this, there no such thing existed. Um, now you have protein bars that actually take pretty darn good. But if you eat one of them, I mean... Are you really satiated? I, I don't really feel satiated no, that's after my a protein pre, bar. That's my pre-meal snack. Right, yeah. right. So why? Because, I mean, it's processed, refined, and uh, made to be very palatable, okay? But take something like a 200-gram chicken breast. Very satiating, right? Um, and that's why when people say, well, carbohydrates aren't very satiating. It depends on the carbohydrate. I mean... When you look at the, like, the satiety index, a plain baked potato is about as satiating as it gets. Yeah, like, if I eat a bowl of oatmeal, mm -hmm. I feel pretty good afterward yeah, I, for it, a while, right? I mean, I, I usually I'll eat that along with some other things, but yeah. I, I, I completely agree. Um, it, the, so you're saying that the, the form that it comes in, maybe even how much chewing is required, 
how good it smells, that it, your it psychological matters. associations. Because to me, a, a steak is a, an incredible meal. Like, I, right. I mean, if I had to pick one food that I could eat, even though I'm not pure carnivore, for the rest of my life, it would be that because I think it would get me where I need to go. And then I'd probably have to sneak some fiber, um, yeah. you know. But 